Less than 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote in the United States. But on May 19th of 1919, the 19th Amendment was passed, giving women all over the country a political voice. And boy, did they use it. An organization called the League of Women Voters was created by the suffragists, the people who fought so hard to give women the right to vote. Their goal in starting the organization was to, quote, finish the fight. We tracked down some present day members who focused their efforts here at the League of Women Voters of Metropolitan Columbus to share with you their stories from the fight for good government. Oh, I love the fact when the League was first founded, it was going to spend was it five, ten years maybe educating women and we would solve all the world's problems and then they could disband. And that was, uh, what, 95, 96 years ago? I joined the League of Women Voters in April of 1957. I joined the League sometime in the 1970s. I've been a member of the League for 60 years. Almost 40 years. 62 years. That's a long time. And I can't really see that we managed to solve all the world's problems. But it does raise the issue, how bad would they be if we hadn't been around? From 1920 and through today, the League has relied on passionate, hardworking, intelligent volunteers to rally around the idea of good government. They plan to do this by teaching newly enfranchised women the mechanics of voting, the ins and outs of public policy, and how to participate in political life. One of the most important things that we do is educating voters, and particularly educating them right before the election so that they can really be prepared in a very concrete way in real life. We have our voter information bulletin that is distributed to over uh, 450,000 households. They're available in libraries, social service organizations, so a wide variety of opportunities to get your questions answered and become more informed. We really changed the culture of how you vote, how you can be eligible to vote. You know, back in the 70s, it was the League of Women Voters of the United States that set up the first presidential debates. That was a, quite an accomplishment to convince the candidates to appear on television and debate each other. And then eventually, when it became accepted, the networks took it over. And I think our impact continues uh, with voter service, candidates meetings, and educating others. Once a project comes up that, or something comes up that needs a community involvement, uh, some study or some action, I think one of the first groups they think of is the League of Women Voters. And the League gives you this nonpartisan credibility that gets you into things and get you listen to. We support positions, but never any political party or candidate. And I think that speaks very loudly to many people that we are issue focused. There are still study groups that a new member can select to be on and learn the issues. And out of these study groups come recommendations for positions. The League has always had this model of building consensus around an issue. And then once that position is defined, then the League can take action on that position. And wonderful thing about the League of Women Voters is it truly is a grassroots organization, from the bottom up for sure. Political action that was nonpartisan and rooted in research and consensus attracted a particular kind of woman to the League of Women Voters. In the 1960s and 70s, the League was at its strongest. They recruited volunteer housewives who were looking for an outlet for their skills and interests. 
those women were eager to take action just for the sake of improving the communities they lived in. First off, everybody's welcome to join the League. People join the League because they want to do something. They want to be involved in this, this movement. Well, when I first joined the League, I think I was intimidated. I went to the, my first couple of meetings and thought, oh my gracious, what have I got myself into? We spent the whole evening talking about whether the United States should recognize Communist China. The presenter of the program, which was about foreign policy, just started in and talked and talked and talked, and I was sitting there overwhelmed. And I thought, oh, wow. We spent a whole evening talking about something substantive. Whatever it was, clean air or water, or children's welfare, voting rights, uh, all of those. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> that's a lot to know. <laughs> By the 1970s, every American over the age of 18 had the right to vote. But providing equal access to the polls for every American was a different story. With a spirit and mission that lives on today, the League pushed relentlessly for open and fair elections and advocated for the rights of all voters. You could drive people down to the Board of Elections during business hours from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, and that was the only way people could register. It's very frustrating, very ineffective, because if you can't vote, you have absolutely no say in, in what happens in government. In 1977, the Ohio legislature passed Senate Bill 125, improving democracy for the state in three ways. First, it allowed Ohioans to vote by mail. And second, it made possible registering to vote on election day. And finally, it permitted volunteers to help other people to register to vote, those who otherwise wouldn't be able to do so themselves. If you did a change of address at the post office, they would automatically change your voter registration. That got knocked out later and we lost election day registration. And then, of course, the last few years, we've been playing defense to try and keep many of those things from being chipped away at. In a democracy, few things are as important as just getting people to the polls so they can exercise their right to vote, and then making sure that the whole electoral process is fair. And that's why the League of Women Voters has such a strong focus on drawing district lines that ensure that voters pick their representatives, not the other way around. Um, Ohio, as we all know, is a battleground state, meaning we are about 50-50. So one would think that with that political climate in Ohio, that our delegation of 16 representatives to Congress would be divided 8-8, eight, 9-7, eight, something along those lines. Unfortunately, the politicians have found ways of drawing those lines to their advantage and not to the voters' advantage. All the time I was in the legislature, I introduced redistricting proposals every session. And it's sort of interesting to look at who co-sponsored them, because when the Democrats were in control of the process, all my co-sponsors were Republicans. When the Republicans got the hold of the process, all my co-sponsors were Democrats. But that is not reflective of the political values of the voters of Ohio. It's too bad. We really have assist. We have developed something that would be better. And we, can, we had a wonderful proposal back in 2010, but unfortunately, it wasn't good enough to convince the legislature that they should try it because no politician wants to give up power. Are they actually the only kind of politicians who want to give up power are the League of Women Voters who believe in fair and equal, impartial districting. On November 3rd, 2015, Ohio passed a pretty darn historic ballot measure, making it difficult for politicians to draw state legislative districts for their own partisan gain. 
In addition to voting rights and fair elections, the League has always had a particular interest in the welfare of children. The Metropolitan Columbus League took a decidedly strong stance when it came to our juvenile justice system. I ended up really looking at child welfare and then the juvenile justice system is where I spent a lot of time in the 70s. And the, the court monitoring was a very important part of our local league and came up with a position in juvenile justice that called for more community-based programming, alternatives to incarceration, enrichment programs, the one-on-one -on -one help with kids because it was clear so many of the kids at the middle school level were ending up at the juvenile courts. And there were not a whole lot of options that the court was offering. Locking up the kids in secure detention was not an option that should have happened, but it did. And once the kid had run away from home a couple times, we were putting them into very punitive deep end of the systems. And we'd like to say that yes, there are lots of community-based programs now the kids are participating in, and if they get into trouble, they've got somebody to help them. If kids have some mental illness, are they getting the kind of treatment? That's still a very, very big need. The League laid the foundation for legislation which has been passed over the last few decades which funds alternatives to juvenile incarceration. State agencies now promote programs that help keep kids that are at risk of delinquency out of trouble. Through this and other changes in policy, Ohio has seen a drastic decrease in the number of children serving time in secure institutions. Along with its efforts to keep children safe, structured, and out of the justice system, the League was adamant about correcting the racial imbalance of our school systems. The U.S. Supreme Court had finally renounced the idea of a separate but equal education, and now school districts across the country were trying to figure out how to put this decision into practice. I had four children, all going uh, to Columbus Public Schools, and so that was the issue that drew my attention and drew me in. In 1977, federal judge Robert Duncan ruled that the state had not lived up to its responsibility to establish a single unified system that offered equality to all. Those were his words in his ruling. Judge Duncan uh, ruled that the Columbus Public Schools must desegregate. And the way that they decided to do that was to bus children from one school uh, that was maybe unbalanced to another school to make it more balanced. So the plan was very, very extensive and there was much um, consternation, I think, by the Columbus community. And certainly the League was trying to um, you know, inform, give as much information as we could to parents and to students. I had um, threatening phone calls to our house, which was a little unnerving. We needed to be prepared, and there were lots of models throughout the country of cities that had been prepared for school seat desegregation. And we visited several of those. We also visited some where there had been riots and where there had been kids hurt and parents hurt and um, mayhem in the streets. And we knew we did not want that in Columbus. The League had published a brochure on what the coming desegregation decision might be or might mean to the Columbus community. And we had over 100,000 brochures printed. We distributed those. And then in 1979, the plan was put into place. We worked uh, diligently to let people know keeping our kids safe was important, helping the kids be in a learning environment was important. And the League volunteers were at schools welcoming children. We were at bus stops making sure they got on the bus and were, were greeted warmly. So we were very, very involved during that whole school process. We felt that busing had worked in Columbus and that we were successful. Maybe the most remarkable thing about the women in the League 
is that the issues they're fighting for are for the betterment of the collective public. But even with the league's reputation for tackling tough political issues, and like so many other nonprofit organizations that rely on women volunteers, the league's membership has actually declined over the years. Well, when I joined in 1970, we had over 900 members. We now have about 200 in the League of Women Voters of Metro Columbus. So many women are in the workforce and they wait until that career is well underway or maybe uh, they're starting to wind down their professional career and uh, have many, many good, useful years ahead of them that they want to do something that's very interesting and useful. But I think we have to face the reality that the younger folks who will carry the league forward aren't going to have that kind of time. They're not like I was uh, at home with two kids and having time to make phone calls and do some research and get a babysitter and go out to a meeting. Those days are pretty much gone, so we've had to change the way that we study issues and reach consensus. And we voted to allow men to be full voting members, and um, in fact, we have a local league president who's male right now, and we've had in the past, and it's happened all over the country, which is great. Um, we also voted not to change our name. We are the League of Women Voters. We started that way, and we were told by trademarking people that if we gave up our name, it could be used by somebody else. And we did not want that to happen because we'd built a reputation. 95 years after its founding, the League of Women Voters looks a little bit different than it did in 1920. But the people who were its backbone in the 60s and 70s can see clearly how they benefited from the League. And we can see clearly how our community has benefited from their leadership. Metropolitan Columbus members went on to found other community-based organizations, like the Columbus Metropolitan Club or the Women's Fund of Central Ohio. They ran for political office and launched new careers as a result of the skills and confidence gained through League volunteerism. The, quote, clubs in downtown Columbus were not at that time open to women. So, uh, that, that was really the impetus behind forming the Columbus Metropolitan Club. The governor's office at that time asked a group of women, and some of us, several of us, were from the League of Women Voters, and I think that's why uh, they, uh, they approached us. They were asking the question, what, what do we need in this community to help people be more informed? What would women like to see. After several meetings with this group of women, a consensus arrived that what we really needed was some kind of a regular forum where people could come together. And we early on decided that it shouldn't be just women, even though it was started by women, it should be women and men. I represented the League on the Metropolitan Columbus Schools Committee, uh, which was made up of elected officials, judges, uh, social workers, religious leaders, leaders from every facet of our, of our community. I guess I have always aspired to be a leader. I seem to gravitate toward the opportunities that would provide that kind of development. And a lot of that, I think, came from League. I learned public speaking, learned how to run meetings, learn what it was to sit down with a group of people who I felt, quote, outranked me. Never got a degree, but what I did get was a PhD in LWV. Some of the things that League did for me, learning a lot about how one operates and runs a statewide campaign. I thought, you know, I've spent a lot of time criticizing legislators. I thought, if I can be that critical, I should get in there and prove I can do a better job. In any event, I just went to the Delaware County Party chairman and said, I'm running for office. I didn't say, can I run for office? Should I run for office? I just said, hello, I'm Joan Lawrence. I'm running for office. And that's part of what the League hopes will happen, is that people will look at issues that are important to them and figure out how to do something about it. 
and really running for the legislature, I touted my experience and knowledge and it all came from the League of Women Voters. I've brought along a copy of the book I wrote and hold it up and say, if you want to know more about the good and bad side of vote by mail, this is a book I wrote for the Federal Election Commission and I can get you a copy of it. And this seems to get through to them that I'm not just a nice middle-class housewife. The whole league consensus building process, uh, major, major influence on my leadership style. I think one of the things that I appreciated so much in the League of Women Voters is people really were not there furthering their own agendas or where they, uh, you know, where they were going. I learned to work with those people, but it wasn't hard. We made uh, good friendships, lasting friendships. Some of the best friends I still have are people that I met through the League of Women Voters. It was a great, great network, and it helped me uh, not only through my league uh, participation, but also in my personal um, involvement and my personal education, if you will. It's made up of people with that kind of dedication. There will always be things we need to fix. So I really believe that whatever small things we can do uh, in our own community are, are going to have a, a ripple effect. Uh, each individual can make a difference. So there's always work to be done on keeping our democracy uh, fresh and alive and reflective of people's values. My, my final last word is, um, I learned a thing when I was a, a kid. Uh, that light which has been given to me, I desire to give undimmed others. Mm -hmm.